Do you know your history? Since my recent video on EverQuest, I've received a lot of really great comments about that game as well as games that have come before it. But this has also opened my eyes to the reality that a lot of people don't know the early history of MMORPGs. Unfortunately, many of the real pioneers have been forgotten, but not anymore. These are the early MMORPGs that you've never heard of. Five cents, Pops. The name's not Pops. I just want to find out about this here parallel world. Uh, it's called Habitat, but cough up that dope, Pops. No playing games. Jimmy, the name's not Pops. Look, I promise I'll pay you as sure as my name is... Valentino. Valentino? What's going on here? What kind of game are you playing, Pops? Ah, uh, Habitat. This was the first graphical, massively multiplayer game ever made. It was released over a decade before Ultima Online, and here's the real kicker. It was developed by Lucasfilm, just after the successful release of the original Star Wars trilogy. Lucasfilm had an entire wing devoted to computer research. In 1984, two employees in that division, Chip Morningstar and Noah Falstein, started talking about a cool new innovation in computing, the modem. They imagined players connecting to a persistent world, running 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and drafted a proposal for a game called Lucasfilm's Universe. But even Lucasfilm couldn't pursue every project, so the proposal was filed away and forgotten. Then Commodore came knocking. They were planning to release a 300 baud modem for the Commodore 64, and they wanted a flashy online game to help promote it. Commodore and Lucasfilm bigwig started talking, and the proposal for Lucasfilm's universe was taken out of the filing cabinet. Habitat went into beta in 1986, with about 500 players, and grew slowly from there. Players seemed to love the game, but there was a problem. Quantum Link estimated that if the game scaled up to, say, 15,000 players, it would consume over 30% of their entire network infrastructure. The resulting network charges would make the game a massive money pit, and Habitat was shut down. A trimmed down version of the game came to Quantum Link in 1988, and was called Club Caribbean. That same version was released in Japan as Fujitsu Habitat in 1990. Perhaps surprisingly, but in a theme that's going to run throughout this video, the original creators of the game actually still maintain a version called Neo Habitat that you can download and play today. The lessons learned from Habitat, which Chip Morningstar and F. Randall Farmer presented in a paper at the first annual international conference on cyberspace in 1990, would prove a major influence on early MMO design. I suggest giving it a read because that presentation, it feels shockingly modern. Many of the issues outlined in it are issues that modern MMOs struggle with to this very day. Quantum Link may have shut down Habitat, but it still wanted to be a destination for online gaming. The company rebranded as America Online in 1989, and it remained on the hunt for a game that could help promote the service. Don Daglow, the founder of Beyond Software, which would later be renamed to Stormfront Studios, knew this very well. He'd worked alongside Quantum Link staff, including its founder Steve Case, throughout the 1980s. Daglow Studio was also making a Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game, Gateway to the Savage Frontier, which would be published by Strategic Simulations Incorporated. Daglow realized this gave him an opportunity. He brought together AOL, SSI, and Dungeons & Dragons license holder TSR, pitching them a graphical MMO based on the popular Neverwinter setting from the Forgotten Realms universe. Neverwinter Nights launched in 1991 exclusively on America Online. Its gameplay was similar to other SSI Gold Box Dungeons & Dragons role-playing games, so much so that it's pretty easy to get screenshots of these games confused. That, however, was not a negative for players at the time. On the contrary, the series had a reputation for complex gameplay and attractive graphics. Neverwinter Nights had all that and added the opportunity to meet players, form parties, and even found entire guilds. The game was a massive success, bringing in between five and seven million dollars annually between its release and 1997. Profits from Neverwinter Nights gave Beyond Software the funds it needed to expand and established AOL as a destination for gamers. 
Habitat may have been the first graphical MMO, but Neverwinter Nights was the first to become a hit. The story of Kingdom of Drakkar begins back in 1984 with the release of a text-based MUD called The Realm. It was created by Brad Leinberger, who gradually added to the MUD over the years. In 1989, he worked with a company called Tantalus to add a graphical front end. It was re-released as Kingdom of Drakkar for the Amiga, and it landed on the CompuServe network. Now, Leinberger, he was not just interested in game design. He actually became the CTO of an early online network called MPGNet, which focused on online gaming. Kingdom of Drakkar was transferred to this service in 1992 and quickly became its premier title, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Neverwinter Nights. Like so many small online networks that came about in the late 1980s and early 1990s, MPGNet never really hit a critical mass, but Drakkar stayed afloat. Leinberger had sold the rights to Drakkar to MPGNet, but he reacquired them when that company went bust. You can still play Kingdom of Drakkar today, thanks to modern updates including a new graphical front end that runs on Windows. Sierra Online Systems launched its online service, the Sierra Network, in 1991 after two years of testing in California. While Sierra had memorable franchises, they were mostly focused on solo play. Sierra needed a big flashy MMO to compete with AOL, so the company turned to Joe Yabara. Though not really active in the game industry today, Yabara was very well known at the time. He was among those who jumped ship from Apple to the newly founded Electronic Arts in the early 1980s, and there he served as a producer on games like the original John Madden Football and A Bard's Tale. In 1990, he founded his own company called Yabara Productions. The studio's first game was 1993's Shadows of Euserbius. The game focused heavily on dungeon crawling, but online play gave a unique twist to this popular style of computer role-playing game. Euserbius was quickly followed by two sort of kinda sequels, The Fates of Twinion and The Ruins of Caldor, which swapped in new dungeons and monsters. Strangely, Sierra hedged its bets with Euserbius and decided to sell an offline-only version in addition to the online-only version. Bernie Yi, writing in the February 1994 issue of Computer Gaming World, complained that the offline version of Euserbius couldn't stack up the new single-player rivals like Ultima 8 and Lands of Lore. The game received otherwise positive reviews and coverage. But like Kingdom of Drakkar, it was held back by the limited popularity of the network it was attached to. And also, like Drakkar, you can still play Euserbius today, thanks to a free, fan-made remake called Medieval Lands. The Sierra Network didn't work out, but Sierra co-founder Ken Williams was still confident about the potential of online games. He urged his wife, Sierra co-founder and game designer Roberta Williams, to make a multiplayer adventure game as part of the King's Quest franchise. Roberta was skeptical, however, that the adventure game genre would translate well to online play, and she suggested that Ken look into a role-playing game instead. He then turned to two of Sierra's programmers, David Slayback and Stephen Nichols, who gave the project a go. The result was The Realm. No relation to the mud that had become Kingdom of Drakkar, by the way. The Realm combined the look and feel of Sierra adventure games with the progression and scale of a massively multiplayer role-playing game. In a departure from its contemporaries, the Realm had turn-based combat, which turned out to be an advantage for people on slower connections. Launched in late 1996, The Realm did manage to attract about 25,000 players, but the press quickly forgot about it, instead flocking the cover Ultima Online. Sierra's internal problems contributed. While co-founder Ken Williams liked the idea, others in the company remembered the failure of the Sierra network and were wary of similar projects. As a result, the company spent little money on efforts to promote The Realm. Like other games here, The Realm never truly died. It was sold off in a package of properties to Codemasters, and the realm was then resold to a company called Norseman Games. 
The game staggered on for a while as a zombie. A 2016 article published by Atlas Obscura noted that the game seemed to be abandoned. It still accepted payment and players could still play the game, but all the contact information for the company was a dead end. Thankfully, this story has a happy ending. Norseman Games entered an agreement with a company called Rat Labs in 2018, giving Rat Labs a license to operate and develop the game. Since then, Rat Labs has maintained the game by fixing bugs, addressing balance issues, and even adding a few new features. You'll find several hundred players still enjoying the Realm Online every night. Now, even these are not the only massively multiplayer pioneers that were released before the genre really caught on in the mid-1990s. Other games from this era include the forthcoming Underlight, Castle Infinity, and, of course, Legends of Kesmai. Now, as always, if you, if you want to find out more about this stuff, there are links to the sources down below. In particular, remember I said to check out that presentation by the creators of Habitat. It's very interesting. If you want to support this channel, please like and subscribe to this video. You know it really helps out with the YouTube algorithm. And if you want to go the extra mile, well, check out my Patreon. You'll also find that in the description of this video. And with that, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.